Uh, hello everyone, we're back and uh, back on the Kozak TV and we're about, uh, we just saw a uh, first round of the debates between Budapest and Sofia but at the same time there were happening eight, uh, eight other uh, uh, debates. So Max, what do you like to tell about? That's right, uh, Dima. So uh, teams from eight schools have come and each school is expected to bring two teams of debate and they debated in the nine rooms. We don't know the outcome because it's not revealed until the next round, but the round that's happening just in two minutes is oral interpretation. Uh, we'll be following room 11. Can you tell us which teams are we'll be seeing, Dima? Yeah, of course, Max. So we will be seeing uh, uh, participants from Kiev, Istanbul, uh, Sofia, Baku and Moscow. And just to make sh uh, sure that you know the rules of about or oral interpretation, I will read them out. So, oral interpretation is a reading using only the voice. The reader will be out of sight of the judges in order to ensure that he or she is being judged on use of voice only. The overall impression must be one of a sustained reading. The material chosen for oral interpretation may come from any published work of literature or and from any literary genre. That's right, and this year the tone will be light. Every year it switches light and serious. So oral interpretation is light while duet acting is serious this year. And the speakers have six minutes to make their speech. Um, we'll be switching to the room shortly as they begin their round. But as for now, um, just a reminder that we're only watching one out of nine rooms in this three floor complex in Kiev International School of the Speech and Debate Tournament. And so it is hectic activity in this building. People are running around in the hallways and lots of things are happening at the same time, but we don't know the results just yet. Um, but we're all excited for the next round. And um, please tell us in the comments anything you'd like to see more of and um, we will sure gladly try to bring it to you. And stay tuned because uh, we have a lot of material coming up. We'll be taking interviews of, of, of participants, of coaches, and just not to hold up for really long, long, we really want to see the first round of oral interpretation. So, yeah. Okay. Oral interpretation, by the way, is something I participated in myself, and uh, it's this activity that's really intimidating because uh, it's there are no boundaries basically you choose the own work yourself that you'd like to read uh, there are no boundaries other than the fact that you need to produce a light reading this year it's light sometimes it's serious and uh, you need to use your voice only so the judges are turned around they're not supposed to see you and so you'll get to see them on the live stream but the judges won't so you get a first seat view so, uh, as I understand, you've been to speech and debate CISA before. Yeah. Okay. Maybe can you tell us more about it? Like, where was it happening? What school did you represent? So that was actually back in middle school. So I think s things have changed now. Um, looks like the round's about to start, and so we'll switch to that room. Uh, hope you guys enjoy this round of oral interpretation.
Isabel Isaacs, and I will be reading Politically Correct Bedtime Stories, Modern Tales for Our Life and Times by James Finn Garner. Little Red Riding Hood. There once was a young person named Red Riding Hood who lived with her mother on the edge of a large wood. One day, her mother asked her to take a basket of fresh fruit and mineral water to her grandmother's house. Not because this was woman's work, mind you, but because the deer was generous and helped engender a feeling of community. Furthermore, her grandmother was not sick, but rather was in a full physical and mental health and was fully capable of taking care of herself as a mature adult. So Red Riding Hood set off with her basket to the woods. Many people believed that the forest was a foreboding and dangerous place and never set foot in it. Red Riding Hood, however, was confident enough in her own budding sexuality that such obvious Freudian imaginary did not intimidate her. On the way to Grandma's house, Red Riding Hood was accosted by a wolf who asked her what was in her basket. She replied, some healthful snacks for my grandmother who is certainly capable of taking care of herself as a mature adult. The wolf said, you know, my dear, it isn't safe for a little girl to walk through the woods alone. Red Riding Hood said, I find your sexist remark offensive in the extreme, but I will ignore it because of your traditional status as an outcast from society, the stress of which has caused you to develop your own entirely valid worldview. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must be on my way. Red Riding Hood walked on along the main path. But because his status outside society has freedom from slavish adherence to linear Western style thought, the wolf knew a quick route to grandma's house. He burst into the house and ate grandma, an entirely valid course of action for a carnivore such as himself. Then, unhampered by rigid traditionalist notions of what was masculine or feminine, he put on grandma's night clothes and crawled into bed. Red Riding Hood entered the cottage and said, Grandma, I have brought you some fat-free, sodium-free snacks to salute you in your role of a wise and nutrient matriarch. From the bed, the wood said softly, Come closer, child, so that I might see you. Red Riding Hood said, Oh, <laughs> I have forgot you are as optically challenged as a bat. Grandma, what big eyes you have. They have seen much and forgiven much, my dear. Grandma, what a big nose you have. Only relatively, of course, and certainly attractive in its own way. It has smelled much and forgiven much, my dear. Grandma, what big teeth you have. The wolf said, I am happy with who I am and what I am, and leaped out of the bed. He grabbed Red Riding Hood in his claws, intent on devouring her. Red Riding Hood screamed, not out of alarm of the wolf's apparent tendency toward cross-dressing, but because of his willful invasion of her personal space. Her screams were heard by a passing woodchopper person, or law fuel technician as he prefers to be called. When he burst into the cottage, he saw the Malay there and tried to intervene. But as he raised his ax, Red Riding Hood and the wolf both stopped. And just what do you think you're doing? Asked Red Riding Hood. The woodchopper person, out, the woodchopper person blinked and tried to answer, but no words came to him. Bursting here like a Neanderthal, trusting your weapon to do your thinking for you, she exclaimed. Sexist, speciest. How dare you assume that women and wolves can't solve their own problems without a man's help? When she heard Red Riding Hood's impassioned speech, Grandma jumped out of the wolf's mouth, took the woodchopper person axe, and cut his head off. After the ordeal, Red Riding Hood, Grandma, and the wolf felt a certain commonality of purpose. They decided to set up an alternative household based on mutual respect and cooperation and they lived together in the woods happily ever after. Yeah, that, that was a uh, funny modern interpretation of Red Riding Hood by our very own uh, I-6 from Kiev. And uh, she used different voices for different characters, which I really liked, which is good although I would make them a bit more dramatic and hit those buzzwords that really make this Red Riding Hood interpretation funny, distinct from the original. Now we have the next participant from um, the next school. I'll 
the judges ready? Hi, my name is Stanley Borden, G8, representing the Istanbul International Community School, and today I will be reading a passage from The Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe. In the passage, three detectives are talking about a murder suspect, Sherman McCoy. So this guy McCoy makes us wait down in the lobby for 15 minutes. When we finally get in the elevator, it dawns on me I don't know what floor the guy lives on. So I stick my head out the door and I says to the doorman, what button do I push? And he says, we'll send you up there. We'll send you up there. You can push all the buttons you want inside the elevator and it don't mean crap. Even if you live inside the place and you just want to go visit somebody else, you can't just get on the elevator and push somebody else's floor. Not that the place strikes me as the kind of place where they just, where they just drop by to shoot the breeze. Anyway, this guy McCoy is on the 10th floor. On that floor, the elevator is just for his apartment. You live a sheltered life, Marty. Not freaking sheltered enough if you ask me. We ring the bell and a maid in a uniform opens the door. She's Puerto Rican or South American or something. This hall you walk into, there's all this marble and we're paneling in one of those big staircases that goes up like this, like something in a friggin' movie. So we cool our heels on the marble floor for a while. And then he comes down the stairs, very slowly, with his chin. I swear to Christ, with his friggin' chin up in the air like this. Catch that, Davy? Yeah. What's he look like? He's tall, got the gray suit, got his chin up in the air. Your typical Wall Street a-hole. Not a bad looking guy, about 40. How did he react to you guys being there? He was pretty cool about the whole thing at first. We, he invited us into this library, I guess it was. It wasn't very big, but you should have seen this stuff up around the ceiling. you would never seen anything like it. So we're sitting there. And I'm telling him how this is a routine check of cars of this make with this license plate and so on. And he's saying, yeah, he heard something about the case on television. And yeah, he has a Mercedes with a license number that begins with R. And yeah, it, pretty, it sure is a pretty big freaking coincidence, all right. And I mean, I figure, well, this is just another jerk-off name on this freaking jerk-off list that they handed us. I mean, if you want to figure out the least likely character that you can think of who will be driving up the Bronx at night, this is the guy. I mean, I'm practically apologizing to the guy for wasting his time. And then I asked him if we can take a look at it. And he says, when? And I says, now. And that was all it took. I mean, if he said, it's in the shop, or my wife's got it, or any other goddamn thing, I don't know if I'd come back again. But he gets this look on his face, and his lips start trembling. And he starts talking this double talk about how he don't know, and what's the routine, but it's mainly the look on his face. So I looked at Davey, and he looked at me, and we both saw the same goddamn thing. Ain't that the truth, Davey? Yeah. Suddenly the bit comes out in him. You can see it coming out. I've seen people like this before. He don't like this stuff at all. He's not a bad guy. It looks a little stuck up, but he's probably a nice enough guy. He's got a wife and a kid. He's got this friggin' apartment. He ain't got the heart for this shit. He ain't got the heart for being on the wrong side of the law. I don't care who you are. Sometime in your life, you're going to be on the wrong side of the law. And some people got the heart for it, and some don't. <laughs> he don't have the heart for you sitting on his freaking desk. <laughs> his desk? Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, I see the guy starting to come apart. And I say to myself, well, <laughs> shit. <laughs> I ain't reading his rights yet, so I better do that. So I'm trying to be real casual about it. And I'm telling him how much we appreciate his cooperation and all. But he don't have to say anything if he don't want to. And he's entitled to a lawyer, and so on and so forth. And now I'm thinking ahead. How am I going to say, if you can't afford an attorney, the state will provide you one free of charge? And make that sound casual when the freaking carvings on the ceiling cost more than a freaking 18B lawyer makes in a year. I look at him like, you're not going to do a chicken shit thing like keeping your mouth shut, are you? Just because I'm reading you your rights, are you? It was worse than that. Marty starts sitting on the edge of the guy's desk. What did he do? Nothing at first. He knows something's up. There ain't no way you can just say, by the way, and read somebody his rights like you're just passing the time. But he's confused. I can see his eyes getting bigger and bigger. The funny thing is, here he starts coming apart when we ask him about the car. And then we go by and see the car, and it's clean. There's not a mark on it. How did you find his car? That was simple. He told us he kept it in a garage. So I figured, if you got as much money as this son of a bitch has, you're going to keep your car in the nearest garage. And the garage, they just showed you the car? Yeah, I just flashed the badge and Davey stood on the other side of him and stared holes in his head. 
The guy says, which car? Turns out that they keep two cars in the garage. The Mercedes and a Mercury station wagon. And it costs $410 a month to keep a car in there. It's posted on the wall. $820 a month for two cars. That's $200 more than I pay for my whole house in Dix Hill. So the guy shows you the car? He tells us where it is and says, help yourself. I asked him if the car was used, a, was used on Tuesday a week ago in the evening. And he says, oh sure, he remembers it very well. McCoy takes it out about six and comes back about 10, looking like a mess. Alone? That's what he said. So you feel sure about this guy? Oh yeah. Okay. Then how do we get a case? We got the starting one right now. We know he was driving his car that night. Give us 20 more minutes with the guy and we'll get the rest. Thank you. So we just had an opportunity to watch the performance by the in Istanbul participant, a very descriptive story with a lot of details and uh, me personally I think uh, making accents on those details that would make uh, the speech suc successful and that what holds the audience. Should I begin? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm Rebecca Stuyarva from the Anglo-American School of Sofia with the piece Willie the Angelic Child by Walter Benham. Good afternoon, Miss Boyer. How do you do, ladies? Isn't it a lovely day? I saw some cars parked out in front, Miss Boyer, and I thought Willie and I would just drop over and spend the afternoon with you. Willie's so fond of company. Say, how do you do to the ladies, Willie? No, no, now. Mama's baby mustn't be so bashful. Speak up like a little man and say, how do you do? No, you cannot have a piece of cake. Ugh. The very idea. Miss Boy isn't going to give you any cake. Just sit on that little chair over there and be a good boy. He's such an interesting child. Oh, are you going to play auction? Go right ahead with your game. Don't mind us. Willie just adores to see ladies play auction. We'll just sit here and talk to you while you play. Willie, you mustn't touch that vase. You're liable to break it. Vases weren't made for boys to play with. Don't you just adore children, Mrs. Boyer? I think they're so interesting when they're Willie's age. It's a real charm and education to watch the development of their little minds. The unfolding of the bud. Yes, he'll be five in January. Isn't he remarkable for his age? <gasps> no! Willie! No! <sighs> Mama says no. That's the dummy. You mustn't touch the cards. <sighs> He's got them all mixed up. Naughty, naughty Willie. But doesn't it show how rapidly his mind is developing? He just adores auctions. Willie. Willie! Put that cushion down. Put that cushion right back in the chair. Miss Boyer does not like little boys who pull cushions out of chairs. <sighs> no, no, Sonny. You mustn't talk to the ladies when they're playing auction. It's so hard to keep him quiet. He talks and talks and talks. <laughs> he has a positive genius for oratory. Why, only last month he recited a selection of this Sunday school entertainment. His father heard him, and he was the proudest man in town. Right then and there, we decided that Willie should be a lawyer. Or a statesman. He recited Little Robin Redbreast, and it would have brought tears to your eyes. He's so emotional. He feels every word he utters. Willie, suppose you recite Little Robin Redbreast for the ladies. Stand right out here in front now. Toes out. Shoulders back. Now. Make your bow. Uh, uh, j just a moment, Miss Steele. Surely you want to carry go on playing auction when Willie's about to recite. <laughs> now, Willie, begin. I'm a little Robin Webb West, so 
Go on. Petty, speak it out nice and loud. My nest is in the tree. That's right. Now make your gesture. There's the tree. Your nest is way up in the tree. Now, go on. My nest is in the tree. Now, imitate the little bird. Oh, that's right. Skip over there. <gasps> Willy, look out for the lamp. Oh, phew. Now skip back again. Isn't he a darling? I thought of that skip myself. Now, the second verse, Willy. I have a secret I like the little girls to know. Point to the little girls, Willy. Oh, there. Isn't that funny? He pointed right at you, Mrs. Steele. Oh, he thinks you're a little girl. Isn't he precocious? <laughs> Go on now. Uh, say it over again, Willie. And uh, let, let Miss Blair see your expression. She was dealing cards and didn't see the full emotion in your face. <laughs> yes, start from the very first. I'm a little Robin Webb West. That's right. Gesture to the right. Isn't he graceful? Now skip. Skip fast. Willie, lift your feet. Oh, the vase! Oh, he's broken it. Willie, aren't you ashamed to break Miss Boar's nice big vase? Oh, come right over here to Mama. She's got to kiss the naughty hand. You know, Miss Boyer, I always kiss his hands when he's naughty. And then he never forgets it. He has a remarkable memory. He can recite several other pieces just as he can Little Robin Redbreast. Oh, are you going, Miss Steele? I thought you always played auction all afternoon. Willie, Willie, put that hat down, you're tearing it. You mustn't mind him, Miss Steele. He's only an innocent little baby. I don't think it's hurt very much. Send around to the model and they'll fix it just as good as new. Goodbye, Mrs. Steele. Come over and spend the afternoon with me someday. I'll have Willie dance for you. He can dance the high land fling. And he gives the cutest movie imitations. Goodbye. Oh, phew, she's gone. Oh, now the three of you can't play auction. We'll just sit here and let Will entertain us for the rest of the afternoon. He's better than a play. Wow, okay, a, a fantastic performance by School of Sophia, D7. I liked her dramatic voices, changes between characters. It was funny. I could feel the different characters, though it was a bit hard to follow the story I found. I would emphasize more the differences between the characters' voices. Uh, and now we have participant from the next school, Istanbul. And today I'll be reading an excerpt out of the book, Holidays on Ice, by David Sedaris. I often see people on the streets, dressed as objects, and handing out leaflets. I tend to avoid leaflets, but it breaks my heart to see a grown man dressed as a taco. So, if there's a costume involved, I tend to not only accept the leaflet, but accept it graciously, saying, Thank you so much. I'm thinking, you poor pathetic fool. I don't know what you have, but I hope I never catch it. I wear green velvet knickers, a forest green velvet smock, and a perky little hat to carry with its bangles. This is my work uniform. We're allowed to change our name depending on our outlook of the snowy weather. My elf name is Crumpet. I have spent the last several days sitting in a crowded, windowless Macy's classroom, undergoing the first phases of elf training. You can be an entrance elf, a watercolor elf, a bridge elf, train elf, maze elf, island elf, magic window elf, usher elf, cast register elf, or exit elf. We were given a demonstration of various positions and actions acted out by returning elves who were so on stage and goofy, that it made me all sit to my stomach. I don't know that I could look anyone in the eye and exclaim, 
Oh my goodness, I think I see Santa! Or, can you close your eyes and make a very special Christmas wish? Everything these elves say seems to have an exclamation point at the end of it. It makes one's mouth hurt to speak with such forced merriment. It embarrasses me to hear people talk this way. I think I'll be a low-key sort of off. 22,000 people came to see Santa today, and not all of them were well-behaved. Today, I witnessed fistfights and vomiting and magnificent tantrums. The back hallway was jammed with people. There was a line for Santa and a line for the woman's bathroom. And one woman, after asking me a thousand questions already, asked, Which is the line to the woman's bathroom? And I shouted, I thought it's the one with all the women in it! And she said, I'm gonna have you fired! I had two people say that to me today. I'm gonna have you fired. Go ahead, be my guest. I'm wearing a green velvet costume. It doesn't get any worse than this. Who do these people think they are? I'm gonna have you fired. And I'm gonna lean over and say, I'm gonna have you kicked. This morning, I worked as an exit off, telling people in a loud voice, this way out of Santa Land. A woman was standing alone at one of the cash registers, paying for her pictures, while her son lay beneath her, kicking and heaving, having a tantrum. The woman said, Riley, if you don't start behaving yourself, Santa's not going to give you any of those toys you asked for. The child said, He is too going to give me those toys, liar. <sighs> he already told me. The woman grabbed my arm and said, You the elf. Tell Riley here if he doesn't start behaving immediately that Santa's going to change his mind and bring him coal for Christmas. I said that Santa changes policy and no longer traffics in coal. Instead, if you're bad, he comes to your house and steals things. I told Riley that if he didn't behave himself, Santa's going to take away his TV and all his electrical appliances and leave him in the dark. The woman got a worried look on her face and said, All right, that's enough. I said, he's going to take your car, and your furniture, and all your towels and blankets, and leave you with nothing. The mother said, no really, that's enough. This afternoon, I was stuck being photo op for Santa Santa. Santa Santa has a little, a little app for the children. He'll talk to them, give a hearty chuckle, and ring his bells. And then, he asks them to name their favorite Christmas carol. Santa then asks if they'll sing it for him. The children are shy and don't want to sing out loud. So Santa Santa says, Oh, little elf, little elf, help young Brenda here sing that favorite carol of hers. Late in the afternoon, the child said that she didn't know what her favorite Christmas carol was. So Santa Santa suggested a way in a manger. The girl agreed to it, but didn't want to sing because she didn't know any of the words to it. So Santa Santa said, Oh, little elf, little elf, Come sing away in the manger for us. It didn't seem fair that I should have to solo. So I sang it the way Billie Holiday might have if she put it out on a Christmas album. Away in a manger, no cream for a bay. The little Lord Jesus lay down. Santa Santa did not want me to finish. The great thing about this Santa is that he never even asks what the children want. Most times, he involves the parents to the point where they surrender their urge for documentation. They all lay down the video cameras and gather around for the festival of love. Thank you. Oh, wow, that was really funny. It made us laugh here in the booth. I uh, really liked the performance of Baku's H5. Uh, though it was interesting how he still walked around and made gestures, though it is just a judging of the voice. Well, now we have Moscow's B10 ready to perform. Ready? Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and honorable judges and components. My name is Kylie Toussaint. I will be presenting a satire of tech entrepreneur Elon Musk's board meeting after his attempt to help the Thai rescue mission of 12 boys and their football coach. This is called Elon Musk 
meets his PR team. We think it's so great that you've been taking an interest in humanitarian aid, sir. How you tried to help those Thai children. You're a visionary and a saint. We did want to debrief after the fact and uh, point out that another way to contribute to future causes you care about might be to build an itty bitty, teeny tiny, child sized submarine. I did that already. Right, no, that was, that was very cool. So cool. And we're sure it's going to come in handy over there in the future. We just thought that another way to help people might be money. I, I like that. Like when you told everybody about your ACLU donations, yeah, we all loved that. That looked great for you. We just want a little more of that and a little less of um, tiny submarines that can potentially someday also be used as space escape pods. I hear you. What, I hear what you're saying. Loud and clear, guys. And I have two words for you. Humor Magazine. Um, I'm not sure. The, I'm Elon. Nice to meet you, not sure. Very funny, sir. Your comedy lessons are really paying off. Let's put aside your humanitarian efforts for now. We also wanted to clear up some of the public confusion about your political philosophy. Right. We were a little surprised a while back when you tweeted that you consider yourself a socialist. Why? Well, it's just that um, usually that word refers to democratic ownership over the means of production. Well, that wasn't how I was using the word. Of course, of course, Mr. Musk. And we understand that. Obviously, as a visionary and an American, you have the right to use words to mean whatever you want them to mean. Thank you, that's correct. But it just might be more effective if you use the words according to their generally and widely accepted meanings. I don't follow. We are just saying, you know, you have this billion dollar company, you're interested in profits. There's no shame in admitting that you're a capitalist. No, no. Marx is a capitalist. Are, are you trolling us right now? Is he trolling us? This is pointless. Guys, 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 come on. My politics are extremely straightforward. I'm a socialist in the manner of Ian Bakes. But Ian Bakes was pro-union. Socialism to me means that once Earth is uninhabitable, I get to decide who lives and who dies because I have the capital. Is that easy enough for you to understand? And if my employees don't like working for 24 hours straight in conditions where they might get run over by a forklift because I disabled the alarm sound that forklifts make when they back up because I don't like beeping noises, then they can quit. Of course, sir. It's like I always say, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. Absolutely, Miss Moore. I wasn't finished. Send a man to Mars, he finds and farms a new kind of fish, a space fish that sustains him beyond the regular human lifespan. Are you writing this down? Immortally. Via space fish. Via space fish. Of course. It doesn't matter if you write it down or not, because it's in the code of simulation. Well, that's usually a sign that we should wrap up. Thanks for your time, Mr. Musk. Is well, the space fish a way. metaphor well, or quite... an actual type of fish? I'm not sure. Bye, not sure. Thank you. So we just saw our last participant of uh, oral interpretory, uh, a participant from Moscow, and 
she uh, show, uh, t talk about one of the story of political philosophy and uh, interesting approach was that one of the character was named not sure and I'm curious what, what will happen next. Okay, so that was the first round of oral interpretation. We just saw room 11, six, uh, five contestants who did really well. Um, just a reminder, this is the event where judges are not watching the competitors and it is strictly, it is strictly um, a judging of their voice. And so what we saw a lot of is changing between characters. So the girl talks like this and then the guy talks like this, right? Is that, isn't that what you saw, Dima? Yeah. And so it's a very interesting approach of uh, telling a stories to keep the audience watching because, or in this case, judges were not watching and it was just only on the voice. I think it was made to make sure that the participant gives everything uh, to its oral uh, abilities uh, when telling the story. And uh, you talked about the experience you had uh, of presenting in o oral interpreter, can you? talk more about it. Seeing all those fancy people uh, yeah, so in like, I did oral interpretation age, back in my like speech and debate days in middle school and I remember I read a dialogue from, it was a light year that year, so like this year it was supposed to be comedic and so I read and uh, I remember also the same techniques trying to differentiate the voices between characters because it is really hard to follow a story, especially a dialogue, if all you hear is voices, you don't hear this guy said, and then this guy said, it's just voice after voice, right? And so I found it a bit hard to follow some of these contestants, didn't you? Um, I think some of their problems lie in just, you know, all of them something every day. read fantastically, not monotonous, you know, just like no, reading with emphasis on specific year, words, like that was all right. Um, I think they should just dramatize the voices and make it, because it is funny this year, so you should really just put all of it, your effort into it, make the voice as different and funny as possible. And in my opinion, even though the judges are uh, uh, not look, looking at you while you're performing, you, you're, they're listening to you, but the movements really help and they're not forbidden when you're doing the oral interpretory. And for example, you, you did the light tone as well in your middle school. Uh, did you use movements at that, at that time to dramatize your story? So, right, I mean movements, it helps me, for example, just some movements because, you know, it's not like you I must understand. stand still. So I could agree with the uh, person from Baku, for example, with making some movements to help himself. And um, I think that's a good technique. If it works for you, it works. If it's not off bounds, it's fair game. And so... Um, there are some video clips being edited, um, and we'll, we'll show them shortly. We'd like to shout out a special commentator, I don't know, some comment section for leaving nice comments about uh, the two reporters. Uh, thank you very much. And so here are some more interviews from earlier today. Hope you enjoy. Um, hey guys, so um, what's your name? Uh, what school are you from? Well, I'm Anastasia, and we are from Hi, I'm Carolina. I'm Emma. Uh, Nikita. Okay, so um, you guys came last night, is that correct? Yes. And uh, what is your first first um, impression of Kiev? Good food. Good food? Yeah. yeah. Really pretty. Do you like your host? Yes. yes. They're so they're like really good. Are you guys going to go sightseeing? Yeah, yeah probably. Um, so what is your, like, are you excited for the events today? Yeah. Are you? Um, how do you think you you're gonna win? Last year, this uh, is my first year. Oh. Oh really? Uh, yeah. Last year was my first try, and we got. I got into both finals. Yeah. Ooh. That's amazing. Ooh. Well, you know, we're rooting for you, so we're gonna watch you. And <laughs> best, <laughs> we really got the wrong person. Best Are you guys one. confident? Uh, with our today's like, features, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, good luck. There's a reason to be confident, you guys. Um, Godspeed. Let's go. <laughs> okay.
Hey guys and girls, this is the Moody Booth, the place where we interview participants and get them moody, in the moody, you know, ready for their rounds. What's your name? I am Matteo. Matteo, where are you from? I am from Italy, but my school is uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Sofia, Bulgaria? That's great. What is your team uh, mascot? The wolf. The wolf? Okay, so the wolves are here, wolves in the house. What events are you participating in? I'm participating in debate and duet acting. Oh, those are my favorite, actually. Well, we'll be watching you, and uh, so far, how have you liked Kiev, Istanbul? Well, I've been here twice, and in both cases, I think Kiev is a very beautiful city, both during the spring and during the, uh, during the you know, autumn and winter, so I like it here. Too. That's true, the climate here, it's one of a kind. Uh, how have you liked your posts? Wonderful, they're wonderful people. Uh, very good food, what can I say? Thank you, those Thank are very you. nice words. Good luck. Uh, good luck in the rounds. And good, good luck to you, to you too. Thank you. Sure. Hey, what are your names and what school are you from? I'm Benji, and I'm actually from Tisa Baku. Oh, okay. Ooh, I've been there. It's really yeah, nice. Uh, We won't hold you for too long. We have one important question. Uh, do you like your posts? Yes. Oh. Um, why is that? <laughs> well, because originally they took more than they needed. There's three of us in one house taking good care of us. Okay, well, that's well, great. And good luck in your debate. Yeah, good Thank luck, you. guys. Good luck. Bye. Okay, we're here with Roman, who's on the Kozak International School team. And uh, we're going to ask him a few questions. So, what kind of um, events are you doing? I'm doing debate and debate. Okay, have you just gone? Have you? Yeah, I finished debate, so in about an hour, I'm going to have a Best professor. Sorry, sorry. How do you think it went? Did you win the whole thing? Well, our case was much stronger than theirs, actually. Like, they barely had any evidence. So. Yeah, I'd say we, we won the debate. Oh, good job. And on to next. So, Mal, did you already do a debate today? Yeah, yeah, so far one. How do you feel? You think you won it? Uh, I have no idea. I've been very anxious to actually get the results. I've been sneaking around Miss Taylor's and Miss Kilby's room, so anticipating that. Um, the debate went generally well. It's my first time doing speech and debate, um, so it was a bit intimidating seeing all those fancy people in suits come in and I'm like, wow, they're actually my age. These people look like they're doing something every day, you know, making a difference in this world and here I am. So, we're back and we just saw a, very, a set of very informative interviews from Logan and Max. Thanks, Max, for doing that. Up next is a first round of oral, oh, I'm, uh, excuse me, original oratory. Right, so uh, signing off, until then, Max and Dima.